Did you know that subscribing to Von Allen Sports will result in your team's opponent being flagged? So subscribe now to make sure your team draws that phantom PI call when it matters most. Click the bell icon for extra RTP. Von Allen Sports, let's go. on the Brady hate saga. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I have to give it up. A-Rod, I'm sorry. Brady got you. It's the notion that the Patriots have a free ride every year because of their division, the AFC East. And if it's not their division, then they say it's the AFC Conference. If it's not that, then it's the schedule in general. Then it's, oh, well, there's no relevant quarterbacks as opponents. His NFC record is better than his AFC record. Uh-oh. Aaron yeah. Rodgers is, is the better quarterback. Into 10 reasons why Aaron Rodgers may be better than Tom Brady. Remember? All right, the answer exactly. to the question is Aaron Rodgers. This question is offensive to Tom Brady. That's what it is. Aaron Rodgers shouldn't even be in the same sentence with Tom Brady. It, it's not even close. <laughs> the quarterback you have the most faith in is Tom Brady. Now, because you have prematurely put him into the retirement home, because you've prematurely anointed Aaron Rodgers over him. He looks old, he looks inaccurate, up, but I've seen better quarterbacks, okay? Yeah, this was never win he was dinking and dunking, even compared to his dinking and dunking prime, he was dinking and dunking. What's up, guys? I'm excited to be back, fighting the good fight, but to be honest, a part of me was hoping season one of the Brady Hate Saga would be enough to, yeah, if not cure, suppress the deficiency that is Brady derangement syndrome. Unfortunately, it appears it has not only not gone away, but it's stronger and has infiltrated its way to places we thought weren't even possible. Now, I have always maintained that when it comes to the Patriots, people hated Brady more than they actually hated the Patriots in general. And it wasn't always that way, but it morphed into that. And I can see why. Brady is the type of success story that makes people feel really inadequate, no matter how much success they have. Because he seems to have it all. Sure, you could become a pro NFL quarterback, but you don't have his rings, so you're jealous. Sure, you could become rich, but you don't have his looks. And sure, you could be good looking, but you don't have his charisma. And on and on and on, you get the point. But no human should have that much success in every aspect of their lives, right? It's just not fair. So, to be a Brady fan, you need to first like yourself and like who you are. And in society, that type of person is a dying breed. So let's talk about jealousy first. On my second album, I actually wrote a song called Trial of Jealousy. And what that song is about is how jealousy of any kind can destroy relationships, all kinds of relationships, marriages, friendships, partnerships, all of those things. Jealousy can ruin you as a person. And then sometimes you're, you're shocked because it's by people you would think, wow, they've achieved so much. Why are they being such jerks, you know? But that leads us firstly to Steve Harvey. Now, we all know he's actually right and partly serious when he says this. Y'all ain't thought of pooling y'all money together having him killed. Of course, he's not serious about wanting to harm Tom Brady, but the the message, he's serious. And that is Tom Brady has stopped so many people, Tom and his team, of course. But this is videos about Tom, so we're just not gonna deal with the semantics of saying, well, it's a team sport and all that crap. Yeah, we all get that. But this is a video about one particular player. But yes, he has been in the way of so many teams and so many other quarterbacks. At the time of this broadcast, Brady was on his way to Super Bowl 53, his ninth appearance. Yeah, I know that sounds insane, doesn't it? That averages out to half of his career when you only include actual qualified playing years. And when it wasn't Brady, it was usually either Peyton Manning or Ben Roethlisberger, with a few exceptions here and there. But when this was done, this was only partly true. This joke, in part, only because Brady was in the AFC. So his dominance had absolutely nothing to do with NFC quarterbacks. So, in this entire century, it's never affected Aaron Rodgers, 
Drew Brees, Tony Romo, Donovan McNabb, none of these guys had to face Brady's Patriots on the way to a Super Bowl. So they were all able to get there. For now, let's focus on the quarterbacks in this crowd. Now, of course, right off the bat, I can't help but notice Travis Kelsey first. And that was only because of whoever that girl is sitting next to him. So bravo Travis on that one. You can see how annoyed he is by Steve Harvey's comment, right? Okay, I get it. Their loss to the Patriots was very fresh. It had just happened less than a week before. But Mahomes, he took this pretty well, actually. He even played along, pretending, you know, smiling as if, hey, that's a good idea. Maybe we should put a hit out on Tom Brady. So I did like Patrick Mahomes' reaction on that one. That was funny. But let's look at Deshaun Watson and Baker Mayfield. That awkward smiling, knowing the camera is going to pan to them, so you don't want to look bothered. But they didn't find this funny. And why would they, right? I mean, it's a legitimate point. These guys want to get to a Super Bowl and there is the greatest of all time who simply just won't go away. Why don't you leave, Tom Brady? Why do you never leave? Well, look at Dak. Dak's loving this. Why? Because he knows it doesn't affect him. NFC, remember? But who loves this choke the most? <laughs> Aaron Rodgers. And I love this. I absolutely love this, okay? Because when this happened, I remember Aaron watching Aaron get a kick out of it. And I was like, Aaron knows that's a good joke. He knows it's funny, but it doesn't affect them. Now, at this time, Brady not being a patriot was unthinkable. So in Aaron's mind, Brady is no threat to him unless it's actually in the Super Bowl. And then that's a good problem to have because that means you're NFC champions, right? So Aaron loves this. But he also is in the knowledge it's a shot at all of the AFC quarterbacks, especially the ones that are in the audience, like Mahomes, Mayfield, Watson, and even Andrew Luck at the time. But that joke has now taken on a new meaning. Within just the last hour, Tom Brady posting on Instagram a photo of himself signing a contract that officially makes him a Tampa Bay Buccaneer. Brady announces he's leaving the Patriots. Brady then announces he's going to the NFC. Now remember my videos about can Brady survive in the NFC? Well, when I made that, I, I never thought that it would actually become a reality. I mean, the idea of him even leaving the Patriots was insane, much less go to the NFC, which is weird. I mean, even Peyton stayed in the AFC. Well, maybe that had something to do with his brother at the time, but still. And now, this joke has become a reality for Aaron Rodgers and Drew Brees? Rodgers didn't think this joke was funny anymore because Tom signed with the Bucks. However, to Rodgers' credit, he is on record saying, I remember when uh, I heard the news about him coming to the NFC, I thought this was a real possibility. And I'm excited about the opportunity to play against him one more time. So, at the very least, Aaron Rodgers knew that Brady was still a threat, even at 43. Even if it was the Tampa Bay Buccaneers who hadn't made the playoffs in over a decade. A team, by the way, that is the losingest franchise in major American sports history at the time that Brady signed with them. With the league situation in the summer of 2020, it didn't look like Brady's new venture was going to have a good start. It's difficult for any quarterback switching teams, especially a completely different offensive system, different style, team mentality, all that. But if you add to that a training camp mostly involving FaceTime calls and the offense and defensive players not even being able to get to know each other well, and then you add to that no preseason? This entire endeavor of Brady's just became a freaking nightmare. This was a disaster, and, and, and everyone knew it too. The media, the talking heads, they all piled on. You could put a lot of quarterbacks no, you can't. in Tampa, no, you can't. and they would no, be you can't. very good. No, you Instead of acknowledging how big of a problem this is, they doubled down on their Brady hate. For me, I was dealing with two problems. I was rooting for two quarterbacks to succeed who are in the same scenario. Cam Newton, newly acquired by the Patriots, who went through the same thing. No training camp, no preseason, new system, new everything. At the time, I tried to stay positive. You know, after all, there wasn't much that was that great, so I needed something, something to be happy about. But I thought if anyone could get through this mess, it's Belichick and Brady. Brady's Bucks got off to an atrocious start. They looked every bit like a team with a new quarterback who hadn't played a down of football together. But even with that, I just hoped that Brady would find ways to get it worked out with his offensive coordinator and his teammates. And things started to improve. 
the Bucks entire first month looked like a preseason, and justifiably so. But, but something became very apparent. Brady's arm was just fine. You said, here's what I'm seeing. Well, that's true. He doesn't have the velocity. He doesn't have the accuracy. It's not just about the weapon, Stephen A. It's about the fact that he can't do it anymore. And it's not just age. I have these two Beetlejuice eyes. I know what I'm seeing. This is what I'm seeing, Stephen A. That's what you said. Sure. That Patriots season was stressful and disappointing, ultimately, but I maintained that I saw no decline in Brady physically. I was heckled. I was heckled weekly by people saying I wouldn't admit that Brady was done because I was such a fanboy. They clearly know nothing about me then. Okay, the moment Tom Brady shows some decline, I will be one of the first to point it out. You know, a lot of NFL fans in general think that Brady is done, or at least can't be elite anymore. Now, my personal opinion, what I'm seeing isn't as much Brady declining, but indicative of the personnel situation. Do you see any diminishing of his throwing power and zip on the ball? I don't see the drastic decline that everyone wants to see. I think there's some sort of bias, confirmation bias, when you have all these people in the media saying, oh, there he's on the down. I know this player. What good would it be for me to see him in decline, but yet not admit it? I would lose all credibility. There's no shame in Brady declining. The man is ancient in athletic years, okay? The fact he hasn't shown any issues since the age of 37 is mind-boggling already, okay? Much less still playing at such a high level at 43. Now, if I become some delusional idiot, I lose all credibility. And credibility is something I care about the most. Without that, I don't believe a person has anything of value to offer anyone. And it doesn't mean I won't make jokes or have a little fun when, you know, talking about other players. But for serious takes, I only give you what I really see. But I honestly didn't see an issue with Tom in 2019. What others were seeing was short passes, missing receivers, things like that. What I saw was scheme and personnel problems. There are way too many NFL fans who judge quarterbacks based on the result of a play not by why it was called. They see an entire game with short passes, they automatically equate that to the quarterback can't throw anymore. Not that maybe that was by design. When they see a quarterback going bombs away constantly, they quickly assume that, wow, man, that guy has a strong arm without even looking at why this quarterback is going bombs away. The real truth is that these guys are professional quarterbacks. They all have great arms. They aren't normal people. That's why they're NFL quarterbacks. A quarterback who can throw a few yards farther than another doesn't mean a hell of a lot in the long run. As the plays and opportunities for home run balls like that accumulate over time, the difference is negligible. All quarterbacks who aren't experiencing a health issue can hit those home run balls. It's the offense, the style of that offense, unless there's something wrong with them, right? So we're talking about an extreme case, like when Peyton Manning was falling off because he was older and his injuries were creeping up on him. That's different. I'm talking about guys who are healthy and have no problems. It's the offense, the style of that offense, and what you can do with it and what players are on the receiving end of those. I don't care if you can throw two yards farther than the other guy if you're constantly overthrowing your open receiver by two yards. It's about ball placement. Where is it going? What avenue did it create for the receiver to work with it after catching it? Did your throw maximize your receiver's catch probability while minimizing the defensive back's probability of deflecting it or picking it off? For example, how many of Brady's passes to Gronk and Edelman were in the bottom right and left corners of the receiver's body in order to make sure that if his guy didn't catch it, no one was going to? To the untrained eye, it looks as if Brady threw a bad ball into the dirt and the receiver just saved the play. Then idiots go off and say, Brady can't throw far anymore. Why would Brady throw it high for anything to happen when he can throw it low and minimize the risk factor down to almost zero? What, just so he can prove to some keyboard cowboys and talking heads that he still has an arm? I mean, come on. Having a big arm is useful and nice to have, but it's only one attribute of many, many things. To Marcus Russell had a big arm, what good did it do him when he was a zero on every other aspect of being a quarterback? Mahomes has a big arm, but he has the other factors that go with it. 
So his big arm is useful because he's making the right decisions with it. He's not a great player because he can throw a little bit farther than other guys, or he can throw a little bit harder. That's not what's making him so great. It's that he's combined it with everything else and ma he makes that power work for him. That's the difference. Now, if Mahomes doesn't have Tyreek Hill, who can get down the field to be the recipient of his throwing power, what would Mahomes do then? Well, he would adjust to hitting his receivers on slant routes and mid-range routes to make up the difference, right? Instead of scoring on one big play, Mahomes will get points on the board in a methodical manner. That's it. But what will they say then? Oh man, Mahomes doesn't have throwing power anymore, right? I want people to understand that these quarterbacks, the smart ones, and the ones who take their job very seriously, they tailor themselves to the style their team can be the most efficient. Just a reference to Mahomes one more time, go back and watch Alex Smith on the Chiefs. Watch him move around, outside the pocket, hitting guys on the run. Smith was doing those things. That was the offense Andy Reid built. That's what he wanted to do. He drafted Mahomes, a guy who could make that style and take it to the next level. If Mahomes was on New England in 2020, he's got no one to throw to where he could show off his arm talent. He would have to tailor himself to intermediate throwing. And this is what Brady was doing. And you could see it in his physique alone. I mean, come on. In 2019, Brady's offensive line had some issues, of course, but Brady was running for his life. He was moving in the pocket better than I'd ever seen him. He worked on this aspect because he knew it was needed based on the situation New England was in. Once Brady knew he was going to the Bucks, he altered his workout slightly to fit Bruce Arians' style of play. Now it was about hitting the deep guy, focus on range, less on quick timing plays. And that's what he did. Brady has not experienced a physical decline yet. That's just the truth. There are so many variables involved. Now, why did Peyton have to retire? Well, his injury started to take its toll as he aged, right? Brady has been blessed to not suffer from anything that was too damaging to his throwing mechanics. Let's not forget that Brady's throwing mechanics utilizes his entire body, meaning his arm alone and his shoulder isn't the single thing doing all the work. And that matters, guys. It matters a lot. Hey there, how you doing? Coach here outside of beautiful Arrowhead Stadium, home of the Kansas City Chiefs. You're watching Von Allen Sports, real and honest NFL analysis. So subscribe now and join the empire. Von Allen Sports, let's go, baby. When Bucks versus Packers in the regular season was approaching, I was getting excited, man. I couldn't wait for this game. The Bucks were still finding themselves, and I, of course, knew that this Packers team was a well-oiled machine. They had just come off being in the NFC Championship game and came into Tampa undefeated. If the Bucks aren't on their game, this could be another Saints Week 1 fiasco, right? They were coming off an atrocious loss to the Bears. Remember? One of the worst games the Bucks played all year. Actually, one of the most undisciplined games I had seen a team play in recent memory. This Packers game had all the makings of a complete beatdown. The Bucks were doomed, right? I mean, this was first and foremost a regular season game. Aaron Rodgers' wheelhouse. Rodgers cares about his stats. He's very, very careful with the ball. And hey, that's to his credit, I guess. Less turnovers means less stress on your defense, right? But the other side of that could be argued how many opportunities missed from not taking the riskier option to make something happen. That's a thing that would mean more in the postseason because clearly Aaron is performing just fine in the regular season. It's working for him. But Kudos to him overall, of course, for such an amazing touchdown to interception ratio. That's not really what this was about anyway. But in that game, the Packers are suddenly up 10 to nothing. Rodgers even doing the Hingle McCringleberry in the Bucks home stadium. I mean, God dang, this looks bad. This looks like it's about to get out of hand quickly. So that entire week leading up to this game, everyone was talking junk, right? Rodgers is still great. Brady is washed up. Okay, okay. Tom Brady's coming off a season where year over year he saw a massive decline in his numbers, not Aaron Rodgers. Okay, at this point, I didn't really feel anything bad about Brady or the Bucks. It was just more of a, wow, this Packers team is legit. But remember though, Rodgers doesn't make mistakes. He's just too damn good. And then this happens. 
Pick six. Remember all the crap Brady got for his week one pick six? No one seemed to care when Rodgers did it. But that pick six saved the game for the Bucks at that point. The Packers were already clicking and the Bucks looked like leftovers from the Bears game. Rodgers threw another pick on that very next possession. However, on this one, uh, this is one of those moments where I call for a separate interception stat for quarterback's fault or not. I mean, that was a pinpoint accurate pass. However, Bucks cashed in again. There's a reason I'm pointing out these picks and what the Bucks did with them. As a quarterback, when your defense gets you turnovers, they give you the ball back, you must reward them with a the score. Even if it's just a field goal, they should get to feel something for their effort, right? When they do it against a guy like Rodgers, you cannot waste it. How many chances are you going to get to pick off Aaron Rodgers, right? Well, the Bucks cashed in. So all is well. Later, Tom gets a low snap, picks it up, moves around in the pocket, leads his receiver in the end zone, and hits him for a touchdown. If that was Rodgers and Mahomes, it would have been replayed over and over, and everyone would be saying, Oh my God, did you see that? Only they can do that. <sighs> it's about aesthetics for these people, okay? Aaron Rodgers can do everything Brady could do, but Brady can't do everything Rodgers can. How many times have you heard that stupid saying or that stupid sentence? Again, Aaron Rodgers could do everything Brady can do, but Brady can't do everything Rodgers can. I have heard this just nearly every Brady Rodgers conversation. I'm going to try to answer this. So Aaron wins more. Aaron is a better leader. Aaron is better than Brady pre-snap and reading defenses. I mean, is Aaron a better pocket passer than Tom Brady? Now, what this really means is Rodgers runs and Brady doesn't, so that means everything, right? Their criteria is pass from the pocket, run out of the pocket. That's it. So if Brady doesn't run, then he's suddenly inferior. It must be such a simple life to be able to think so small and then believe you are clever, right? Tell me again, why is running so important? If a quarterback's ability from the pocket is superior enough to make up the difference, then how is it a bad thing? Usually, running for a quarterback is panic mode. It means that they can't find the receiver or don't believe that they can fit the ball in there. The amount of plays these quarterbacks take off running, the actual lanes to run that actually open up aren't that common. The guys are running when they shouldn't a lot of times, and that is my point. And yes, there are times where a quarterback should take what's given to him. Absolutely. But when you start to rely on that and it becomes instinctual, you start to take off instead of letting the play develop. Exciting looking doesn't automatically equal the best results. The new trend in the NFL is for the quarterback to be the best athlete or one of the best athletes on the field. When you do that, you cut down your options greatly and game planning for you increasingly becomes easier with time. A defensive coordinator, they get to game plan one man, the quarterback, and they don't have to focus as much on multiple players. This phenomenon happened most recently with Lamar Jackson. The Ravens caught people off guard. That happens a lot. But then the NFL catches up with that style of play always, right? If you have a quarterback who is a threat to get it to the most obscure, eligible receiver on the field on every down and can get it out from the pocket, it's just too damn difficult to scheme against. You need an elite secondary to keep up with that, and you need a pass rush that can bull rush the line and, and to get into the quarterback's face and disrupt his timing. This is a very tall task for most teams. So when you're game planning for a guy like Brady or Peyton, you have to account for not only their best target, but you have to account for the random third string dude that nobody even knows is there or on the team. With quarterbacks whose instincts are to run after things get difficult, you only need to cover up their favorite first two targets. Then you know you have them on the run. It's more manageable if you don't have as much talent on the defense. So it's easier for the league on average to stop a quarterback like that than a quarterback who drops dimes all over the field to anyone. That's why the pocket passer is still relevant and still wins. When you don't have that instinct or ability to run, you have no choice but to raise your passing skill level and your reading of defenses. It forces you to find other areas to exploit. A running quarterback, and we see this constantly, resorts to that so easily when things get tough or things get tight. As for a career, that's problematic because the legs are usually the first things to go on a quarterback, not the arm, like people think. 
unless he has a specific injury, of course. So suddenly, you find that your quarterback prime is on par with a running back's prime. You're all legs and youth athleticism and nothing else. So you either evolve or you're done. The Super Bowl is consistently represented and won by quarterbacks who are excellent at throwing the ball that season and or considered statues. Not having that flashy ability to run never hindered a lot of the great quarterback's ability to win MVPs and or play in Super Bowls. Of the 17 MVPs this century, won by quarterbacks. 11 of those MVPs were won by quarterbacks who are strictly pocket passers. Of those 11, seven of them made it all the way to the Super Bowl. Of the past 21 Super Bowls, equaling 42 quarterback starts, 33 of those quarterback starts are from guys who average single digits in their career rushing yards per game. And they're all with 6.7 yards or less per game. The remaining nine quarterback starts had double digits starting at 15.6 yards per game all the way up to Cam Newton's 38.6 yards per game. Only nine, guys. Nine out of 42. It's quite clear that being a pocket passer with limited reign ability is not a hindrance on winning or being a great quarterback whatsoever. It's simply a case of visual bias. In this case, visual equals better for most people, especially younger fans. Children and younger fans in general almost always like the flashy player, not the fundamental guys, even if the fundamental player is technically a greater player all around. Now, this is something that happens in every sport, of course, but usually when a grown ass man acts like this, okay, it could hint that they think more like a child and grab onto the cotton candy and not want the more satisfying steak dinner. It's no wonder guys like Chris Sims, Max Kellerman, Nick Wright, Shannon Sharp, they all like the same players. Each NFL draft, you can predict which quarterbacks those guys will hype and the ones they will shun. They are all highly known for being illogical jackasses and they all have the same exact taste. The point here, is it saying that being a dual threat quarterback is necessarily bad? I'm saying that being a pocket passer mainly isn't a bad thing and is quite often, especially these days, underappreciated. Don't forget, it was the statue Nick Foles and Eli Manning who beat Bill Belichick in three Super Bowls. It was a statue, boring as hell, Joe Flacco, who outplayed a dual threat Colin Kaepernick and won Super Bowl MVP. It was the statue Tom Brady who outlasted Donovan McNabb. Well, you could use Brady for many Super Bowls. But speaking of Brady, of all his 11 playoff losses, only two quarterbacks were in double-digit career rushing yards per game. And they both happened to be bookends of his playoff losses. His first playoff loss was against Denver to Jake Plummer. And his last playoff loss was to the Titans, Ryan Tannehill. For the other nine quarterbacks, all statues. Clearly, there's value in pocket passing. So don't diss it offhand just because it's not flashy and sports center highlight worthy. All styles should be given their due and should be analyzed for the production and result that comes from it. And this is why we keep running into the problem of Rodgers versus Brady. It's this bias that always creeps up. How many games and how many seasons were lost because Rodgers got injured? Tom Brady had one freak accident, but at least they didn't lose him in week 10, you know? They lost him in the beginning, so they had, they, were, they had time to adjust, they had time to understand what they were dealing with. But ever since that, he has never missed a game due to injury. Now, I hope you interact here, but most importantly, I hope you subscribe. I respond to everyone who watches the whole video, and I truly appreciate you spending your free time watching our videos. Time is a precious thing, and you're spending it here, and that is awesome. Thank you. Bon Allen Sports.
That was outstanding on so many levels. Look at that torque! Oh 